All right, so final keynote for the day. Um, I first heard about Aaron Dignan through the company that he was CEO of, which he'll talk about a little bit, Undercurrent. Um, I was putting on a little bit of a, a small conference, especially small compared to this, uh, at Stanford University that was founded by BJ Fogg. It was on the intersection actually of dance and behavior change. And some folks from Undercurrent reached out to me hearing that I was looking at essentially movement in the workplace, saying, oh, we're interested in this too. We're interested in the human body at work. Uh, and they started to talk about the work that they were doing at Undercurrent, and that was actually my introduction to the responsive movement and responsive.org. Um, since then, I've learned a lot more. Uh, I, I would uh, be proud to call Aaron a friend. Um, I'm systematically just impressed with the work he's done. He's been a big part of making this possible. When I look at Undercurrent, the thing that I'm most impressed by uh, is there was a diaspora of everyone who worked at Undercurrent last summer. And every single group of people I've followed from that company that was only like a 35, 40 person company has had the courage to go forward and do their own next thing. So there were 45 or 50 people and each of them in, in pairs or in trios or in small groups have gone on and started, whether, whether it's succeeded or not, to found their own company. And I look at that and I look at the impact that each of those little companies would have as a result and, and what happened to bring those people up and what Aaron did, what the leadership team at Undercurrent did to bring those people up. And I say that, to me, looks like a successful company because those people had the courage to try something new. Aaron is one of the founders of the Responsive Org Movement, and he is the CEO and founder of The Ready, which is a change federation, and he'll talk about that a great deal more. So without any further ado, the keynote closer for the day, Aaron Dignan. All right. Uh, when you speak in public a lot, the buzz that you get slowly gets lower and lower like any good drug. Uh, and I think it's because in this industry you get to go in and be like, hey, people of Earth toiling in misery, I have all these cool new secrets to share. And as I started thinking about this conference, I realized you guys already know all my secrets and you know secrets of your own. And so I got a little, so now I'm like super buzzy. Uh, and so I decided instead of doing my usual shtick and talking about responsive orgs and the change and all the history and everything, I would mostly say new stuff. So this is completely from, from my head to your ears uh, for the first time. And so I titled it, To Whom It May Concern. Um, if you're a client, if you're you know, in a big company, a small company, a change agent, uh, an org designer, a student, um, some of this may concern you. So uh, start with, with who the heck I am. Um, if, for those of you that enjoyed Erica and PepsiCo's session this morning, I too dressed up uh, when I was little in terms of what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, this is me going to, uh, to kindergarten and first grade. I did about 180 straight days of this outfit. Um, <laughs> no exaggeration. They called my mother in and said, this is really starting to freak us out and could you ask him to stop? And my mother, who is an iconoclast, was like, no. Nope. Just let him fly his freak flag and let him wear it out. Uh, and eventually I did. Um, so, so it's not surprising that you know, be, wanting to try different things and do things differently than the way everyone else did them led me to this sort of interesting and, and you know, kaleidoscopic career. And the most seminal and important moment of that was the starting of this company, Undercurrent, that, that Robin mentioned. And Undercurrent, when looked at in, in forward view, was just chaos but in reverse view was just an eight year search for the most interesting problem on earth. That's all it was. And we sort of went like, okay, we're young millennial weirdos. Social, is that interesting? Kind of. Digital strategy, that's kind of cool. Exponential technology, I like that. Management consulting, oh, whoa, there's a lot of stuff there. What's this, what's org design? Oh, that's it because it's the nastiest puzzle, right? It's the underlying, most fundamental puzzle of it all. How do we organize as people? How do we organize as human beings? It is the fundamental building block upon which all progress has to unfold, right? So if we're gonna beat climate, if we're gonna fix education, if we're gonna fix politics, if we're gonna figure out how to create you know, organizations that are both responsible and meaningful and beneficial and abundant, it all starts there. And in a way, you know, 
that, that center point goes back to individual education and individual participation and self-awareness and all these other things, but the gathering point is this org design concept. And so it felt really, really important. And we decided as a company towards the latter part of our, of our tenure to become a test kitchen, to become a lab. And so what you're looking at here in this picture is you're actually looking at the moment when some of the employees decided to share their salaries transparently with everyone else. <laughs> Look at the faces. <laughs> we broke stuff, we bent stuff, we stretched each other. It was, it was challenging and interesting. And, and at the end of it, we realized that I think almost every one of us had found a calling. And that calling is what fed that diaspora. It's what fed that kind of explosion of entrepreneurship and exploration in the space and our participation in responsive org and other things. Now, there's a problem with org design, as you guys know, and this has been played out today in a lot of different forums that I've, that I've visited as, as I sort of audited the courses. And it feels like college here, doesn't it? I feel like I'm fully in college. Um, I dropped out of college, so it's especially special to me. Uh, Adam and I have that in common, except he has me beat with the high school thing. That's like valley credit, a whole new level. Um, <laughs> So, so every speech I do all around the world, from you know, Sweden to Asia to here, I ask people to date this org chart. I just get a show of hands from the audience, what year do you think this is from? And everywhere I do it, I hear no less than a 100 year range of guesses. It's from 1999, it's from yesterday, it's from 1880. In actuality, it's from 1920, sort of the early railroad uh, org charts. And what's fascinating about that is it just means that like essentially nothing's changed. If I showed you a house from that period, if I showed you a dress or a shoe or a person or a building from 1920 and said, what year is this from? You'd be like, eh, it's depression era. And we show the visual behind how we organize our businesses, behind how we structure the work. And everyone's like, I don't know, could be from horse and buggy times to now. That's, that's really, really disturbing. And so that, that tenacity and that, and that uh, persistence of that way of working has become kind of my new obsession. Um, and the whole thesis of the ready is basically that there are just two kinds of people in the world now. People that are ready for what's about to happen, what's coming, what is happening with complexity and technology and humanity, and people that are not, that are, that are stuck or not even looking at, at what might be changing or what could unfold. And I think there's a really simple reason for this, and a, a friend of ours uh, as a movement um, has the, the best summary of it. This is uh, a little visualization of Niels Flaging, our, our German counterpart's take on the fact that management is a zombie technology. And instead of brains, it wants brains. Um, and, and the zombie technology is the zombie because it's dead, and it doesn't work anymore, but it like, doesn't know that. And so it just keeps marching along. We keep doing it the same way over and over again. And, and it, has to, it has to be killed. We have to actually figure out a way to, to knock it down. Now, I've started to study some of the other changes that have happened in our way of working and look at what are the parallels, what can we learn. And what is bothering me right now is that when you go back and look at kind of you know, scientific management, the publishing of scientific management, Frederick Taylor, Tayloristic you know, way of working, thinkers and doers and Henry Ford and all that, that took 19 years to go global from the time when he published the book and set up, he set up a tent at the World's Fair and he showed people, I can make this many pins this way and I can make this many pins that way. And everybody was like, that's dope, Freddie. We're going to do it. And it spread like crazy. And so in 19 years, you have a global phenomenon shift. The way we work changes fundamentally in two decades. Right? And so you ask yourself, well, how does that compare to this movement? We sit in here today thinking that maybe like future of work feels fresh and it feels like a millennial thing, and it's not. Uh, <laughs> McGregor wrote on human enterprise in 1960, right? And I would argue, you know, you can debate it with me, but I would argue that like 90% of the stuff we're selling is in that book. And it's 56 years later, and it's like nobody even read it, right? And then you look at something like Office Space. Office Space put out in 1999. Here we are 17 years later. And again, like almost if you went to an IT shop in Iowa and just walked in, I would argue it would be indistinguishable basically from this, with the exception of like there's Facebook on the screens instead of, you know, Lotus 123, although they still have Lotus. 
And so what I wanted to bring today was rather than bring you future of work stuff and tactics and techniques and all that, I just wanted to actually get real with y'all. I wanted everybody to like take a moment, let's look in the mirror, let's disabuse ourselves of some beliefs that we hold. I certainly hold these. You may identify with one or more. But I basically have collected seven things we think or things we say as a community that we need to cut it out. And then three reasons for hope. Three things that we could start doing more of and thinking more and sharing more of that would actually hopefully break this thing down and, and lend, it, uh, lend it a hand. And so that's it. So that's what I wanna, I wanna spend our time going through. Here's number one. We just need to prove it, guys. That's it. They just wanna see the facts. They just wanna see the statistics and the metrics. They wanna know that they're gonna get more engagement. And they wanna know that they're gonna get more innovation. And they wanna know that it's, they're gonna be able to do more with less. And if we just show them the facts, well, then everything will work. But what's really scary is when you start talking to people that have been doing change work for years and people that have been studying culture for decades, we're not that rational. We'd like to believe that, but when you actually present a huge body of people with two choices and one alternative is drastically better than the other, they don't always make the right choice. <laughs> they don't. We do not care about facts. We say we do, we don't. We like to see them, we like to have them, we like to hold them, but we don't actually want to understand them and they're not going to drive our behavior. And so this idea that we have to prove it is, is misguided. We should and we can, and it has largely been proven in certain contexts, but that's not going to be the thing that like breaks the, the levees and we all you know, get called a million times a week to go do this work. Second thing, we just need to simplify it, right? I cannot tell you how many times someone else in this industry has been like, well, I really like holacracy, but it's just too complicated. <laughs> I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? But it's too, they can't get it. It's too complicated, right? And who cares? Maybe it is. But here's the problem. Work is complicated. Human beings are complex. Teams and groups coming together at a scale of 10,000 or 50,000 or 300,000 people, like some of our clients, you're not going to make that simple. Sorry. And if you do make it simple, if you figure out like the code of the algorithm, the simple rules that people talk about of, of complex systems, and you figure out we only need these three simple rules, you still have to get 300,000 people to A, believe that, and B, do it. And that's not simple either. And so this idea that somehow we're going to find like the kind of holy grail of simplicity and that's going to be, we're going to get all Thoreau on it, right? This is Walden, by the way. Um, have, did anybody get that? Like super big Walden fans? Okay. So... <laughs> So that's the second thing. The third thing, everybody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. It's so easy to get stuck in this echo chamber when you're on the responsive org Slack and you're on Twitter following the people that just you follow. Our tech is designed to surround us with people that think what we think. And so when you're sitting in here on your Slack and somebody looks over your shoulder and, it's, and you're seeing a Slack from a friend that's like, oh, snap, did you hear that Medium like, dumped Holacracy to go do their own organic self-organization? The person behind you is thinking, WTF is medium, WTF is holacracy, and like, what's the score on the game? I'm switching over to Twitter to see what's going on in the NFL. Like, it, that, that doesn't even register with regular people. We just think it's big news because of where we are. And when you say like, oh, well, there's articles in Forbes every day. When you actually call them and ask how many people read that article, it's like 3,000, 6,000 of the 330 million people that are in this country. Right? These are not big numbers. Even when it's on the cover of HBR, it's still not, we're still not there, right? So it's not enough to just have everybody be talking about it in our click. We've got to break that down. The fourth thing, and one of my favorites, it'll happen organically, man. Just got to let it go. Don't try to drive it, right? We all believe in that emergence and everything. We're all like kind of, you know, hippie. So let's just like let it unfold. Look at this. We're all here. It's working. <laughs> Right? But here's the thing. When you actually look at revolutions that happened organically, and this is the French one, they're violent. Because people have to lose what they have to want something else, and people have to take something to get it, and there is violence in change, especially organic change. There are winners and losers, and there is tension and tumult that happens in those moments. Now, some of that's inevitable, but I believe that our job is not actually to make this happen. I think it's going to happen anyway. I think our job is to make it happen in a way that is deeply human 
and, and, and accelerates the change and softens the change and makes it palatable and reduces the violence of it, if possible. And that is a really challenging mandate, but it means that we don't get lost in the like, oh, it'll figure itself out kind of route. Fifth, I just had to use some Steven Seagal. Um, we're, we're not above the law. I think one of the things that I struggle with the most, and I notice teams around me struggling with the most, is when you do this work and you're you know, the head of the class, or you're the person teaching it, or you're the team doing it inside your organization, it's real easy to think, yeah, we're it. Like, we're doing the future of work right now. We are the cutting edge. There's no, there's no more there there. We're just doing it. And it's easy to start talking about and thinking about ourselves as different, or better, or other, right? And in fact, like, we've just scratched the surface. And if you're doing great on inclusion, you're missing it on how you're using social technology. And if you're doing great on agile, you're missing how we make decisions. And if you're making decisions with integrative decision making, well, what about all the other decision frameworks? You haven't learned about those yet. It is a deep pool. It's a deep pool. And we have to swim in it a lot longer than we have been to sort of claim those stakes. And the longer I find people swim in it, the more humble they become and the more of a lifelong learning process it is. And even for those cultures that are really good at it, that we hold up as our case studies, they have that perpetual beta about them. So we've got to drop the attitude when and where it rears its ugly head. The sixth of seven uh, is if we give them growth. That's what they all want. The Fortune 500, they all just want growth. Nobody can grow anymore because they can't go fast enough and they can't steal their share of the marketplace. They can't, I had someone actually say, extract value the other day. Let's extract some value from this category, right? They, that's all they want, so let's give it to them, right? And in many cases, this is probably my biggest, my cardinal sin, is I love to sell this as the bait and switch, right? Which we go and say, yeah, we'll give you growth. Yeah, sure, yeah. This makes, this works for growth. It's going to help everybody go faster, better communication, we're going to be aligned, we're going to go faster, we're going to make choices, we'll be responsive to the market, and you'll grow. And that's true to a point. But the problem is, when you start chasing growth with a responsive mentality that becomes participatory and drives for equity and ownership and multiple stakeholders and participation, suddenly the system doesn't care as much about growth anymore. Right? The system cares about holistic benefit about balance, about sustainability, instead of the Uber model of, let's extract every ounce of value from this economy and this system, and then we'll see what happens. Because again, what was talked about earlier on one of the panels, the VC model is, just build it and flip it. Make it Marissa Meyer's problem, right? We'll just make Tumblr, we'll sell it for a billion dollars, and then she can deal with that shit. That's the mentality of our entrepreneurs today, and so as a result, we think that growth is the answer, but it's really, it's just this mirage, right? And it's not that growth isn't important. If you have a mission or a purpose and you want to impact the world, that needs to grow to a point of sustainability. But, you know, I put a picture of, uh, of our friend Doug Rushkoff up here because his re recent book, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, talks about how, you know, growth is the enemy of prosperity and our economic OS is predicated on all these ideas, just like our organizational OS is predicated on all these old ideas. Our economic one is too. And the idea that we should have centralized fiat currency lent at interest and we should have, you know, this sort of upper class trickling down the means of production, that's all baked in to the dollar. It's baked into how we exist. And so it's a perpetual issue now where we have a, an OS cancer here and then another one on top of it. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for profit and I'm all for growth and I care about money too. But it just can't be the single design constraint. It can't be the main principle by which we design, or we're going to fail. And so on number six, I think we have to be careful about how we promise growth. And we have to at least be conscious about the ethics of promising growth that leads to potentially the destabilization of a system as the stakeholders begin to take over. And the seventh and final uh, you know, kind of reflection in the mirror is when we say to ourselves, well, this is just agile all over again. And I've heard that in two ways. One way I've heard it is, oh, this is nothing new because this is just agile for the rest of the enterprise. And that's, that's one way to think about it. And the other one is, this is agile all over again, meaning we should just do what agile did because that worked, right? They like, you know, built this movement and they wrote a manifesto. And I mean, you can see we're telegraphing what they did, right? We wrote a manifesto. They wrote a manifesto. That's no accident. We sat in a room and talked about that. But here's the problem. Agile didn't work. Only 16% of companies are really doing Agile today, decades later. 
and the other 84% are talking about it, but they're not actually doing it. It's way more fun to talk about being responsive than to be responsive and to do the painful work. And it's way more fun to just say, oh yeah, we're agile, we do agile, and then just do waterfall behind closed doors, right? So we have to, we have to really think about the fact that not only did it not work, but what we're selling, what we're driving towards is infinitely more complex. It's not just a way to make software. It's not even just a way to make work. It's everything. It's the whole canvas, the whole operating system that needs to change. And so it's a much bigger challenge, and that is something that we're, I think, confronted with every day. Okay, now, enough of the bring you down stuff. Uh, there's good news, which is, as we've observed what's happening in the space, and even today, just walking around, talking to people, seeing some of the sessions, there are some some realities, some realizations that we've had about what works and how it's working that I think we can use to move this thing forward. Okay, so there are three, because uh, we only have so much time. Um, the first one is that experiencing is believing. Reading is not believing, seeing is not believing, hearing it, watching a video, going to a conference, none of that matters. What really matters is can you get someone in it? Can you get them in a system, even for a month, even for a week, even for a day, to just do it rather than talk about it. Because it's so, so easy to sit there and argue about doing performance management a different way or argue about making a decision a different way versus just getting in there and trying it out and then saying, all right, retrospective, what just happened? How did that feel? Was that any different? What do we make of it? And I know from the people here, if you've worked in a self-organizing company or a company that is contemporary or whatever you want to call it, uh, you would never go back to the other way, right? It's really hard. And I've actually had employees that have left companies that I've run and are looking and shopping other jobs and being like, ah, I just can't do it. Like, I just can't go back to working for some asshole trying to drive some metric I don't believe in for some company that's not doing the thing that I think they should be doing. I can't do it anymore. And that's what we need. We just need people to have that one experience that means that they can't go back and we will starve the systems that don't want to do this of talent. <laughs> I mean it. We have to starve them out. All right, that's the first thing. Second thing, labeling is limiting. I'm the biggest proponent of a framework. I love a framework. I love a name. I love an acronym. You've probably heard some that I you know, generated in the shower. I don't believe that labeling is helping us anymore. Responsive, teal, contemporary, agile, adaptive. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. And what it does is it creates an us and them scenario, right? Oh, you don't know that word? Oh, you don't know what teal is? Read this obtuse book that has a <laughs> foreword that reads like a you know, self-help horoscope. It's a great book, but you gotta get to the meat, right? It's a good book, but you gotta get to the meat. Uh, you know, that's not gonna do it, right? And so I think the thesis here is, let's just talk about what it actually is. And what it actually is, is just asking someone this question. Do you care about how you work and organize? Does everyone at your company care about how they work, how they get work done, and how they organize? And if the answer is no, then you say, all right, well, there's an interesting problem right there. And if the answer is yes, there's a part two, and this is where you really get the knife in, which is, are they able to do something about it? Is every employee at your company able to do something about the way they work and the way they organize? And as everybody said today up to this point, that's going to be the difference. That will be the defining characteristic of the companies that succeed or fail, win or lose, you know, transcend, et cetera. It'll all come from, do we sweat it? Do we care about it? Do we just, do we exude the way we work matters to us? It's what we do. It's how we do it. That's critical. So chill with the labels and on with that question and that line of thinking and that way of talking and communicating. And then the third thing is our myths need a reboot in the worst way. And, you know, we got, we've gone from this sort of 60s, 70s, 80s mindset of, you know, you're going to grow up, you're going to go to Harvard, you're going to work 20 years, and then you're going to become the CEO. And that was the, the mythology, right? Become the executive. To a new mythology, which is drop out of college, start a startup, and flip it to Marissa in five to ten years, and then go buy an island somewhere. And that's the new mythology. And that's a terrible mythology. It's a mythology with no ownership and no heart and no soul and no meaning. It's just all about demonstrating power and leverage, to, to Adam's point, but in all the wrong ways. 
And so what we need is rather than Twitter kind of clapping nervously at the bell when they went public, you can see the nervousness in Ev's face, right? He's just kind of like, did we just fuck up? <laughs> yup. Yes, you did. Um, to a new mythology that's about building things to last. And I actually heard people say this on panels today. Build things that last. Build things that have meaning. Build things that are connected to the community. We need to lionize that. And we need to share those stories. And we need to connect to that in a way that we're not doing right now. And that means a different kind of case study. And it means getting excited about a different kind of thing. OK, so that's all the time we have. Where I'll leave you is that I'm more optimistic than it sounds. I really feel like things are starting to break through. They're start, things are starting to unravel. We're seeing patterns we haven't seen before. We're seeing companies at the table that would have never been at the table a decade ago. In many ways, that growth paradigm and that, and that VC community and that, and that sort of change in technology has created a set of stressors that are so intense that the community out there is just saying, we have to change. We have to rethink this. I, you know, people are alone going home and saying, I don't feel whole. I don't feel purposeful. I don't feel connected. And so the moment is different. Even though it's been 56 years, the moment is different. There is something happening now. We just have to be focused and dedicated to the way we're doing it. We have to be deliberate about the way we're participating in this inevitable change, this reluctant, inevitable change. And for that, for your help, for your participation, I am humbled, and I thank you. Uh, I, I'm just so grateful to be here to experience this with you guys, and I can't wait to see what happens next. <laughs>